In the annals of unsolved mysteries, few stories hold the chilling intrigue of Maria Jose and Marina Menegazzo's case. It's a puzzle that to this day eludes explanation, defying the bounds of reason. So, buckle up for a mind-boggling exploration into a narrative that transcends the ordinary and plunges us into the depths of the unknown. In 2016, two spirited Argentinian students, Maria Jose Coni and Marina Managazzo, decided to embark on a South American escapade, craving a breather from their university studies. Little did they know that their journey would transform into a gripping tale, one of the most intricate investigations on the continent. Beyond their academic pursuits, the duo dedicated their time to volunteering for an organization aiding those on the streets, earning them a reputation among friends as two radiant souls deeply connected to their families. On the fateful day of January 10, 2016, Maria Jose, Marina Manago, and two other companions set out on a spontaneous journey, fueled by the promise of a few days of liberation from their studies. This particular year, they chose to explore the vibrant landscapes of South American gems, Ecuador, and Peru. Their social media accounts showcased the sheer joy of their travels, from stunning scenery snapshots to glimpses of the diverse places they explored. The adventure took an unexpected turn on February 13, 2016, just over a month into their travels. The group split, with Marina and Maria Jose opting to linger in Ecuador, while their two friends jetted off to Mendoza. Far from a random decision, this was a calculated plan made before their departure from Argentina. With a few extra days before school opened, the dynamic duo opted to soak in more of Ecuador's charm. As their friends retraced their steps to Mendoza, Maria Jose and Marina made a pit stop at the sun-kissed beaches of Montanita, a place that had already captivated them in the early days of their Ecuadorian sojourn, drawing them back with promises of paradise-like beaches and a holiday ambiance. In the quaint town where backpackers from various corners of the globe congregated, the girls not only reveled in the coastal beauty but also hustled by selling fruit salads and hamburgers on the beach, a means to stretch their budget and cover the $10 a night cost of their hostel. As days unfolded, their social media feeds continued to tell the tale of their joyous adventure, splashing in the sea, basking in the sun, and radiating happiness. Little did they know that this Montanisa interlude was meant to conclude on February 22nd, as they had a flight from Lima to Chile scheduled on February 25th. The plan, from Montanita to Lima, where a night with friends awaited before jetting off to Chile. Everything seemed meticulously plotted. Flight tickets, accommodation. Early morning on the 22nd, Maria Jose and Marina Menegazzo shared laughs with their families, packed their bags, and by afternoon, casually dropped the hitchhiking bomb. A stolen $7 from their hostel fueled the need to tighten the purse strings. The families, ever ready to help, offered to wire the funds, but the girls, ever the adventurers, waved it off, assuring their folks not to worry. And then, the unexpected twist. Communication vanished into thin air. The families, anticipating a chat before the flight or during their Lima layover, found themselves in silence. The afternoon of February 22nd marked the disappearance of signals and updates. Come the early hours of the 25th, the flight to Chile was set to whisk them away, promising a triumphant return to Argentina by the 26th. But alas, the girls never made it back. On the 27th, worry started to settle in the families. Marina's sister took to social media, sharing a photo of the two friends with a plea. My sister and her friend disappeared on Monday, the 22nd, in Montanita, Ecuador. Please help spread the word. In a swift response, Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa sent a comforting message. The police are already investigating. Hug your parents and Maria Jose's parents. All of Ecuador is with you. Desperate for answers, the families tried reaching out to the airline to find out if the girls had left the country or boarded their flight. However, the airline insisted on a court order before disclosing any information. Fearing the worst, the parents considered the possibility that Maria Jose and Marina Menago might not have even made it to the destination, speculating something might have happened along the way. The disappearance quickly went viral on social media, drawing the attention of both Ecuador and the girls' home country. The two nations rallied together, sharing the news far and wide in hopes of locating the missing girls. The uncertainty came to a devastating end on February 25th, when Maria Jose's lifeless body was discovered about 200 meters from the beach. The grim discovery continued on Sunday, February 28th, when Marina's body was found, a mere 40 meters from where Maria Jose lay. This is where the puzzling aspects of the case emerge. If the bodies were so close, why was Marina found three days later? To piece together the timeline, an autopsy became necessary. 
Maria Jose's body was found by a man who stumbled upon the area while relieving himself. Both girls were wrapped in bags inside a sack, bound with ropes. Maria Jose displayed signs of a bruised skull, injuries to various body parts, including the genital area, a fractured femur, numerous bruises and scratches. Marina, on the other hand, suffered six sharp force injuries, ranging from her chin to the first cervical vertebrae. She also bore abrasions on her face and various parts of her body. Adding to the intrigue, both girls had wounds on their wrists, suggesting they were bound. The grim conclusion was that they perished on the same day, only hours or minutes apart. The date of death was determined to be the early morning of February 23rd, a day after the second body was found. Ecuadorian police, announcing the tragic findings, shared that the first arrests had already been made in the case, two people taken into custody. The tale takes a shocking turn as two men, Alberto Segundo Mina Pan and Aurelio Eduardo Rodriguez, alias El Rojo, emerge as the prime suspects. Bloodstains taint Mina Pon's home, and Marina's belongings, including her phone and backpack, surface nearby. What's truly astonishing beyond their swift capture is the immediate confession from both men, a confession that left a profound impact on those witnessing the unfolding events. They claimed to have spotted Maria Jose and Marina Manago outside a bar, seeking a ride to Guayaquil. Struggling to find a lift in that direction, they allege that El Rojo approached them. According to him, the girls spilled their story where they were from, their predicament of having nowhere to stay and being robbed that morning. El Rojo, seemingly benevolent, suggested crashing at Mina Pond's nearby place, emphasizing that he lived alone, so no issues there. A cab ride later, around 8.30 p.m., they arrived at the man's house. El Rojo left them, promising to return later. In a gruesome turn of events, fueled by alcohol, the men allegedly wanted to engage in unwanted sexual acts with the girls who vehemently resisted. Maria Jose was the first to meet a tragic end, struck on the head by Mina Pon with a metal object. As her life slipped away, a scream echoed from the next room. El Rojo had reportedly stabbed Marina six times from her chin to her first cervical vertebrae. The two men, now facing the grim reality of what they'd done, were at a loss. According to their chilling account, El Rojo fled the scene, leaving Mina Pon alone with the lifeless bodies around 3 a.m. Mina Pon, in a disturbing aftermath, cleaned the house, wrapped the bodies in bags, secured them with ropes, and transported them in a wheelbarrow. Maria Jose's body was the first to be discarded, followed by Marina's. Their twisted rationale believed the murders would go unnoticed, buried in the night. However, the prosecution presented a different narrative. Witnesses, including the bar owner and the cab driver, contradicted the killer's version. The bar owner recalled the girls asking for a ride hours earlier, looking exhausted and claiming they had no money due to a morning robbery. El Rojo, seemingly playing the savior, stepped in and they left together toward Mina Pond's place. The cab driver shared a similar account, El Rojo in the front, Maria Jose and Marina in the back, silent and appearing a bit drowsy. Dropping them off without much inquiry, he returned to his business. The families, skeptical of this narrative, found it odd that the girls accepted help from these strangers. The plot thickened when it was revealed that Maria Jose had credit cards and even used one near the hostel in Montanita. This contradicted their claim of having no money. The family found it implausible that, among the many Argentine tourists in Montanita, the girls would approach strangers for assistance instead of seeking help from their fellow countrymen. The mystery deepened, casting a shadow over the initial narrative spun by the alleged killers. The brother of one of the victims revealed a bizarre incident during the police tour of the crime scene. He spotted used syringes on the floor, but when he questioned the authorities, the syringes mysteriously vanished, not even making it into the crime scene photos. The family suspected a larger, more sinister operation at play, perhaps linked to human trafficking. As the investigation unfolded, the two accused men seemed to be just the tip of the iceberg. The family believed they were merely a front for a more extensive enterprise. Simultaneously, the inquiry took unexpected turns. A second autopsy and a toxicological examination were scheduled. The two defendants repeatedly altered their version of events, casting further doubt on their credibility. In a surprising twist, Mina Pond shifted blame, claiming that a Venezuelan drug trafficker known as El Chamo was the actual culprit. El Chamo, despite passing DNA tests, was swiftly removed from the investigation. DNA samples collected at the crime scene included Mina Pons, the two victims, and several unidentified samples, none of which matched El Rojo or El Chamo. 
The revelation from the second autopsy was particularly shocking. It changed Marina's date of death from February 23rd to February 25th, suggesting that when Maria Jose's body was found, Marina was likely just days away from her demise. This fueled speculation that Marina might have endured kidnapping, abuse, and assault during those unaccounted for days. Further unsettling details emerged. Bruises and scratches on Maria Jose's body suggested she may have been thrown from a moving car. Both girls had injuries in the genital area, confirming the violence they endured. Maria Jose's fractured femur, noted in the first autopsy, remained a baffling mystery as no corresponding injury was identified. The toxicology analysis added another layer to the chilling narrative. The girls were found to be under the influence of substances capable of robbing a person of their will, providing a potential explanation for their uncharacteristic behavior when they got into the cab, silent, tired, and seemingly drugged. Numerous setbacks plagued the case, with three changes in prosecutors causing significant trial delays. Despite the hurdles, Alberto Segundo Minon and Aurelio Eduardo Rodriguez were eventually sentenced to 40 years in prison, marking the conclusion of a deeply troubling and convoluted chapter. But wait, the story doesn't wrap up neatly after the trial and convictions. No, it takes another twist. A reinvestigation kicked in, and remember those mysterious DNA samples hanging in the air? Well, they were yet to reveal their secrets, because two more arrests unfolded. One of the accused got a clean slate as the DNA test shouted, not guilty, as he had a rock-solid alibi too. Now, enter Jose Luis Perez, a new character in this unfolding drama. His DNA said yes to the crime, and he found himself in the hot seat. He was the guy who stumbled upon Maria Jose's lifeless body while answering nature's call. But now, he had to defend himself against some compelling accusations. His defense played the toothache card, claiming the blood found on the wall was merely a result of him spitting it out due to his dental woes. Lawyers argued that his DNA on the girls' bodies was just a friendly transfer from some piece of furniture they all touched in the house. The plot thickened when his dentist took the stand. Turns out, Jose Luis Perez did show up but a solid two weeks after the gruesome act. He wanted a certificate for a tooth infection, but the dentist refused. With that revelation, Jose Luis Perez's defense crumbled like a house of cards. And if that wasn't enough, it was a bit too coincidental that he stumbled upon the first victim's body. Fast forward through a lengthy legal process, and come November 2019, the gavel fell on Jose Luis Perez. He too got slapped with a 40-year sentence for the murder of the girls. Now, you might think the case is tied up in a neat bow, but mm, not quite. Those unidentified DNA samples still linger, casting shadows on the unanswered questions. What went down on that fateful February 23rd evening in the house? What unfolded in the two days Marina was alive without Maria Jose? Were there more players in this dark tale, and if so, how did the sinister plot unfold? Kidnapping? A carefully orchestrated plan. The families of both girls are still on a quest for justice, battling the lingering mysteries. Have any hunches about the cab driver or the bar owner's involvement? Hmm? Drop your thoughts in the comments below and let's unravel this story together. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss out on our deep dives into mysteries that defy explanation. Ring that bell icon to stay in the loop and join our community. Until the next video, stay tuned and stay safe.